This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. With me, I have Pugal Vijay Raman, the father of the modern renaissance of conduction system pacing and his bundle pacing, his dot one on Twitter. Don't diss the hiss. Pugal, welcome. Hi, Rod. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, appreciate you having me here. It'd be fun to talk. Thank you for about joining us. You know, you were supposed to be in multiple sessions in HRS, but one of the sessions that we're highlighting is the China Heart Rhythm Society session on conduction system pacing and his bundle pacing. I know that you've been around the world teaching and obviously learning from local experiences. Can you talk to us about the value of the collaboration that you've had with China with his bundle pacing and conduction system pacing? Absolutely. Um, so I can briefly touch upon. So when we were trying to uh, promote his bundle pacing into the national stage, uh, we first looked at who has the most experience in his phone pacing in the U.S. and outside the U.S. So we quickly identified uh, Yijian Wang as one of the premier users of 3830 lead. That was our indirect way of identifying. So we formed a collaboration right there in 2015 when we conducted our first national satellite symposium and heart rhythm society meeting. And Yijian was part of it, and he presented his experience while we started the whole his phone pacing movement there. So that collaboration continued for the first two years, and we shared a lot of our challenges and difficulties. And while in the meantime, he had worked on the left bundle branch pacing. And so that was an extension of conduction system pacing, addressing some of the limitation of his phone pacing. And you know the rest of the story. You have so many collaborations and papers, and including you. Uh, we have conducted so many of those studies, so it's a... And I will always cherish the memories of, of you and me and China together with Wei Jin and, and watching, observing, and, and just the in exchange in the, of ideas and, and methods. I think it's really, really special and, and really memorable. Now, when you were talking, now when you talk about his bundle pacing, many people do it in selected cases but you really have adopted it for all pacing cases. Can you tell us a little bit about the Jack paper and the rationale for doing it in narrow QRS and we can kind of branch out towards wide QRS? Yes, uh, thank you. So it was our initial approach. We started as doing it in uh, limited cases, but as our experience grew, we learned that we could perform his phone pacing in almost every patient who needs a pacemaker. And so from 2010 onwards, uh, myself and my uh, then partner, uh, Gopi Dandamudi. And so we both uh, performed conductions of his bone pacing in all patients from 2010 onwards. So we have at least 10 years of experience attempting his bone pacing in all those patients. So with that, we had a huge learning curve showing that our success rates can be significantly higher. And we came to a good uh, saturation point of about 90% success rate in all comers. So we were able to look at that experience and compare with my colleagues from my um, other hospital, sister hospital in the same health system. So we compared with the right ventricular pacing over a three, three and a half year period of implantation and a two year follow up. And so that was about close to 765 patients. And we were able to show that uh, what is, while his model pacing was always aesthetically pleasing and very satisfying for an implanter, we had to show the value of it in clinical outcomes. So we looked at both mortality and heart failure hospitalization and any need for upgrade to biventricular pacing. So that outcome point in all comers, we looked at and it clearly showed about up to 30% relative risk reduction in those patients who underwent his bone pacing. And to confirm that theory, almost all of this benefit was only in those patients who had more than 20% ventricular pacing. Right. And there was a strong trend towards a reduction in mortality as well. Obviously yeah. not randomized, but I think that is what was also quite notable. Now, I know that you've then moved over towards left bundle branch block pacing, these interceptal fixation techniques, because we do know that the thresholds tend to be a little bit higher with selective conduction system capture. Can you tell us about what the current state of the Geisinger practices now because that's a really important slide in your talk about how you approach a patient with pacemaker uh, requirements. 
Yes, so early when we did his panel pacing, uh, we were looking for any threshold uh, of 2.5 volts at one millisecond. And of course, when we used that protocol, there was about 15% of patients who were at that high end of the threshold, 2.5 or more sometimes. Uh, that's suggesting the limitation of the location where we are pacing from in the fibrous tissue. So currently what we do is we attempt hispanal pacing to start with, especially in all patients who have narrow QRS, AV nodal block, or patients who need AV nodal ablation. We start with hispanal pacing and look for a site with a threshold less than 1.5 volts. Uh, that's our goal because we know that if we can program around 2.5 or 3 volts, then the battery longevity is as good as a regular pacemaker. And if we don't achieve that number, then we quickly move on to left bundle branch pacing. So that's the first step. But if you have patients with either left bundle branch block and baseline, or if they have underlying HV block, then we choose to move on to left bundle branch pacing quickly using his bundle pacing location as a target and then do the left bundle branch pacing. So with this approach, I can say that we are close to 98, 99% success for conduction system pacing. Uh, and so which completes the picture of not having to deal with high threshold and with the failure rates can be addressed by doing the conduction left funnel branch pacing. Yeah, and I, and I wanna congratulate you also on one of your late breaking abstracts looking at left funnel branch block pacing in CRT showing that those thresholds are well below 1.5 in, in the subacute setting. So I think that's very impressive with correction of QRS. Yes, so the left bundle branch pacing gives you thresholds consistently uh, at one volt or less at 0.5 milliseconds. So it's uh, uh, as good or better than even a right ventricular pacing threshold in most patients. Well, Pugel, thanks for joining us. I wanna thank you for spearheading and igniting the flame for all the enthusiasm for the return to physiology with, with conduction system pacing. And also, you know, as a friend and as a colleague and collaborator, I wanna thank you for kind of co-founding this Physiology Pacing Symposium. I know we're supposed to have a, a fourth annual this year. Maybe you could tell people that are interested about that a little bit, whether we're going virtual or what the plans are. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Rod, and uh, you've been a wonderful collaborator. and. I have to mention that uh, while we were uh, in the dark uh, trying to figure out how to correct left bundle branch block with this bone pacing, your very insightful study has actually helped us understand the left bundle branch block much better. And that is also part of the reasons why we moved on to left bundle branch pacing, trying to get beyond the side of block, as you've showed most of the blocks are in the distal his or proximal left bundle. And so that's a big deal for uh, moving the conduction system pacing forward. And lastly, thanks for reminding, bringing up uh, the collaborating project on a physiology pacing symposium, which is very near and dear to both of us. And because of the coronavirus, we have a lot of challenges, uh, uncertainties. So we're trying to plan for it uh, tentatively in Tampa at the end of October, probably October 30th, 31st. Um, but it could possibly turn into a virtual symposium with uh, possible live cases, demonstration. So we'll make it a lot more interesting. Yeah, and to the, to the viewership, if we do go virtual, we expect an amazing attendance. And then also we have talked about highlighting challenging you know, cases as well as just from bread and butter all the way to the most advanced cases. So I think it would be a unique opportunity for us to explore virtual if we need to. Thank you, Pugel, for joining us. Thank you for teaching China and the rest of the world and all of your enthusiasm for this field. Clearly, we need a lot more prospective studies and studies like his sync we look forward to and then all of your left bundle branch block pacing CRT studies are really valuable for us to continue exploring this. Thank you, Rar. I appreciate you uh, for having me here. Thank you.